Um, next up, we have Mike Zanino. Thanks, guys. And he did a interesting residency. So six years, combined EM, IM, and critical care, and boarded in all three. So he is here to tell us how to, the nuts and bolts of the academic ladder, of advancing the academic ladder. All right, great, thanks. And uh, thanks for having me today. Um, so yeah, so I am gonna talk about successfully negotiating the academic ladder. And um, the title of my talk was given me. I didn't actually um, put this title together. So I'm gonna kind of potentially go off the rails just slightly because for good reason. Um, and the first thing as I should put out is a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is, is that though what I'm gonna say is, is, is based as much fact as possible, um, ultimately this is opinion and advice, a lot of these things, and perspective. And one important thing with that is there are many potential ways to achieve your goals and to succeed. And so there are different opinions. And some of these can both perfectly um, be, be right or acceptable. Um, it's interesting because you know a couple of the things that were said previously, there's going to be a little bit of an overlap. I agree. And, you know, we're going to see what we kind of talk about some of the similar points. There's a couple points that actually came from a slightly different perspective, and that's OK. Um, so let's start with this. Does anybody know who? Either of these guys are? Who do we got? Is here? Where is here? Who's this guy? That's Walt Disney. All right. Does anybody know this other guy? Who knows this other guy? You got it? No? This is his brother, Roy. Nobody knows Roy. But you know, Roy ran the operation. Walt was the visionary. He was the big picture guy. Roy was the guy who got things done behind the scenes. And when we talk about the nuts and bolts of promotion, I actually think you're kind of running your own show here. You have to channel. Uh, I think that most people kind of fit into a Roy or a Walt. And then some people are kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, I will admit I'm more of a Walt. I know that about myself. So when I run, because I effectively run, we'll talk a little bit about a large, um, a small business within a business, business in a sense. Um, I know to make sure that I have a lot of Walt's around, or at least a, a Walt around. But when you're coming up for your promotion, I think that we need to start with a vision. And so this title is talk nuts and bolts, but before we start talking about nuts and bolts, I want to talk about a vision and who you want to be. And this was kind of introduced a little bit in the last talk. But specifically speaking, there's a couple different pathways. And this is, this is kind of how things are put out in the, in the, in the um, uh, in, in the Harvard system, where I'm affiliated, but I think it's kind of similar in most other hospitals or in academic centers, is that there's the independent investigator, the clinical um, expertise and innovator, and then the teaching education pathway. Um, and there are differences in how you would approach this based on these pathways. Um, just out of curiosity, do, uh, how many people would look at themselves as looking at the independent investigator pathway? They're into a research pathway. Okay, so a few hands. Okay, great. How many people are looking in the clinical expertise innovator pathway? Okay, teaching education? Great, okay. And then unknowns? Okay, that's okay too, yeah. So when you're first starting out, I agree with um, a lot of what Dr. Brown was talking about, the independent investigator pathway about you know, the right mentorship and whatnot. But when you're looking to be an independent investigator or an innovator or an educator, I think there's a difference in, in terms of how you start out. Now, I started out by talking about vision and waltz and creating who you want to be before we get into this nuts and bolts. And here's, here's where I'm going with this. I think it's important to figure out what you want to do, where you want to be, and how you want to succeed. And after you're done with that and on the road, then you can get into this nuts and bolts of how to get promoted to assistant, to associate, to professor. To me, that's secondary. The most important thing is for you to figure out where you're going, and that other stuff is going to follow. If you want to be an independent investigator, in my opinion, um, and this is, I'll talk a little bit about it, but this is kind of where I would put my category. Interestingly, in the system where, where we get promotions, um, almost everybody who works who has an MD, even if they are primarily research, are kind of slip into this innovator. So I actually spend um, 
90% of my time uh, is, is research grant funded or more. But nonetheless, so I would look at it as an independent investigator. So if, you, if you're looking to be an independent investigator, your priority coming out is grants and funding is just a, is a major priority and original research is the mainstay in the currency. Um, whereas if you're an innovator, an educator, grants are helpful, but they're not essential. It's not gonna make or break your career. Original research is good, that'd be great. If you could actually publish what you're doing in education, and publish uh, original research on what you're doing in, in innovation, that's great. But it's not gonna make or break your career three or four years from now. If you are an independent investigator and you have no original publications and you don't have a grant, in five years you're gonna be kinda stuck. So it's important to know where you wanna be because you need to figure out where you're gonna put your time. There's only so many hours in the day. If you're an independent investigator, I guess review article is okay, it's not a bad thing, but again, it's not the real currency that you're working with. Whereas a review article, if you're an innovator or an educator, that could actually be important. One of the, um, I don't know if folks know Dr. John Edlow is one of the uh, professors in our group. Um, he wrote a review article on Lyme disease published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And overnight, he was the world's expert on Lyme. He ended up going on to write a book on it. People call from all over the country to ask his opinion about Lyme disease. Okay? That review article, he tells me, was one of the biggest boosts in his career. So, so this could be good. It's important. But it's not as essential as an independent investigator. So when you look at lectures, we talk about the importance of lecturing at conferences and, and, and networking, I think, is, 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 is uh, excellent and important for an investigator. But again, the manuscripts and the grants remain the priority. And again, for an innovator and educator, you want to be developing your, your expertise and your reputation and whatnot, and lectures are good. Um, journal reviews, I think they're, again, this is kind of a continuum. Um, there's a time when you, you want to start doing some journal reviews so you get under, you, you learn and whatnot. But again, if you're spending your time reviewing 10 papers, but you're only actually reviewing one of your own, then there's a problem. So everything's a balance. Um, so the essential elements for those who raise their hands for the independent investigators, what is my grant or way to get funding? And I agree before is that um, it's important to identify the mentor in your team. Um, the point was made that you need a postdoc. Um, I think that Dr. Brown makes a fair point. I have to admit, um, I did not obtain a postdoc. Um, I yeah, actually, I, I think that, and, and I've mentored a number of people who don't have postdocs, but they did have this strong mentoring team. Um, I actually wish I had a mentoring team. It's a long story. Didn't really, you know, <laughs> just wasn't in the cards, and I kind of bootstrapped it up. But I don't necessarily advocate that. But identifying a mentor in your team, though, I think is essential. And developing, you know, so what, what I first do is someone comes in, they want to be an invest, independent investigator. First thing I start thinking is, what is the grant? How are we going to get this? And you start developing your publication story. So like, if you want to try and go for a grant for A, and they say, OK, what do we got? Someone mentioned before some preliminary data. You can turn anything into preliminary data. I will publish anything, turn anything into preliminary data. Start getting a couple of things out there, some publications. Start building your story so when you put your grant in. But the simultaneously, and this gets to some point that you said too, is that I, I also think I don't get people too, I think it's important to stay focused, but at the same po token, I, 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 also have, I also encourage people to put a couple chips on the board. And I'll tell you a story, you know, the pulmonary critical care, I actually live in two worlds. So the pulmonary critical care world is very, very focused. So they take this guy and say, you know, you're going to be this eosinophilic researcher. And he put all his eggs in this eosinophilic basket in the lab. And five years later, his experiments weren't working out. And he has one paper to show for it. And he was just struggling and floundering. So I do think that while you're working to make your publication story, whatever that is, I put some chips on the board. So, you know, someone may be doing something along like a, you know, sepsis um, you know, severity of illness scores and working in this area, but they'll collaborate and they'll work as a team with the other folks in the group and they'll put some chips on the board in terms of some other things in sepsis or cardiac arrest. So now you have a publication record. Go to the NIH and say, here's my grant, here's my publication story for my grant, but oh, by the way, I also have another five publications here. I'm a big, big proponent of teamwork. I think this is a team sport. Um, unfortunately, I think, since I'm supposed to talk on the nuts and bolts, Sometimes the promotions itself are not structured in a team sport way. I think that's a problem. Um, I work within, I try to focus my life on what I can change and what I have to do. So I play the rules, we do that stuff in that area. But I think it's important that it's a team sport. I'll get back to that a little bit later. So for the innovator and educator, I think it's important to figure out what's your area of expertise. 
what's the topic or innovation within that area. And then you still also want to develop, I think, a publication record. I will publish any, I talk people to publishing anything, because you can. I, you know, we had someone in the lab, and she, she developed this, I don't know anything ab uh, about you know, pipetting and whatnot, but I, I, I conceptually was able to kind of build this lab for some of our needs in the clinical space. So we needed this assay. And so she put together and she developed this assay. And that was great. So we, did, so we now were able to use this assay to check some things in the blood that we were, we were doing. And I said, you know, you spent four weeks building this assay. Can you publish that? I don't know. I don't know. We don't know. There we go. She has a first author publication in developing an assay. You can publish on a number two, a number, any number of things. You know, observations that you make turn into publications, turn into careers. We'll come back to that. So publish um, uh, strong review article, original articles, uh, important case reports, series, and looking again for lectures and opportunities. I think, again, the theme that Dr. Brown said is that I think it's important to find something you're interested in. Um, I think it's, an, it's, it's a good thing to kind of go into a popular area, but not necessarily that popular. So, you know, around when I was starting to um, first do some research, uh, hi induced hypothermia post arrest was the big thing, targeted temperature management, and everybody was going to targeted temperature management, induced hypothermia. I was interested in post cardiac arrest. So, when everyone went like this, I kind of went this way and said, you know what, I'm going to do some things in post arrest but I'm going to stay away from targeted temperature management because everybody else is there. And then bang, 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 bang. People were interested to see what we were doing post-arrest, but it was just different than where the other 15 investigators were. So I, I think you find something popular, but you can sh sh slide it to the side just a little bit. Uh, and sliding to the sli side a little bit can be very effective, and I call it those paralleling ideas from other areas. So in other words, I'll use cardiac arrest example again. So I do some work in cardiac arrest. There's tons and tons and tons of studies out there on sepsis or there were uh, and steroids but nobody had looked at steroids in post cardiac arrest so we took the same studies the same design and we shifted them over into cardiac arrest all of these you know severity of illness scores that were used in sepsis they weren't used in cardiac arrest so we shifted them over and then all of a sudden bing 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 four or five publications so the idea of taking a parallel concept and just moving it over just slightly and we're doing that right now with another uh, fellow in our group had some interest in diabetic ketoacidosis. There's not a lot out there in diabetic ketoacidosis, so we took a whole bunch of stuff from these other areas and just slid it right over. And he's going to do a bang, 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 couple, couple publications is our plan. So paralleling is a good strategy. Look for the whole. Look, what's, what, what, where's the knowledge gaps? This conference is perfect to go walking around and you know, looking at the abstracts and whatnot. You get to get an idea of where there's a hole, where's a, where, where, where there's a, um, something to build upon or to move in a different direction. And challenge accepted norms, OK? Go over things like one of, one of my colleagues, uh, Dimitri, over at the University of Minnesota, he says when the American Heart Association guidelines would come out, he would just open up the guidelines and start looking which guideline he wants to challenge. That's his next study, OK? Um, so, and, and, and a lot of these things come from clinical observation. We'll see in the next slide. Um, has anybody not heard of cannabinoid hyperemesis? Has anybody not heard of cannabinoid hyperemesis? <laughs> OK, so back. When I was first in attending, this had not actually, it takes me slightly, um, but um, it actually hadn't been described in the United States. Um, and I saw this kid come in over and over and over again, vomiting, and he was using marijuana, and there was nothing else. He had CT scans, MRIs, so I was convinced it was the marijuana, but I couldn't convince anybody else. Presented an M&M, did all these type of things, except Peter Rosen, um, he bought it. Um, and he published it in the Journal of Emergency Medicine. And at that time, everybody thought it was crazy to think something that should help with vomiting actually may be causing vomiting. Okay? But it, looking at something that is just outside the, and at that time, right now, I, I love the expression on your face. You're like, yeah, of course we've heard of it. <laughs> that was not long ago when that wasn't even, it was like, not a thing. Can't be. We tried to publish a paper where we looked at, um, I start, it, it's just your own clinical observations. I had a resident come and staff a case me one time and say, yeah, the patient's septic, but they're doing OK because their lactate's 1.2. I was like, oh, OK, all right, all right. I walk in the room, and I see the little pump on the side, you know, doom, doom, more epinephrine, dopamine coming from this side. I'm like, ah! Went out there. I said, what do you mean the patient's doing OK? Well, the lactate's OK. The lactate's OK. So anyway, so we went and go and took care of the patient. 
But then I said to myself, well, how often does this happen that someone has a lactate of 1.2 and is on two pressors, on three pressors? Well, that led to a paper, non-lactate expressors and septic shock, and a whole series of papers. We actually couldn't get the first paper published because one of the reviewers says this is not what sepsis looks like. This is what our data actually looked like. We found 45% of people coming into ED with sepsis actually had normalized lactates when they came in. So a little different story of why that happens. So look for things to challenge accepted norms. See it and then report it, teach it, study it, repeat. My entire career was based, uh, uh, largely of my NIH work, was based on a case I saw as a resident. Guy came in with a lactate of 30 and abdominal pain. And this is a while ago, so it took a while to get through the CT scanner. So you wouldn't send someone back for a two, three hour routine at the CT scan. Someone comes in with a lactate of 30 and abdominal pain, you know where they went? They went to the OR for dead gut. Except when he went to the OR and he opened his belly up, it was pristine. There was nothing wrong with his belly. Got him back from the OR, brought him to the PACU, and the anesthesiologist was sweating. I actually had gone up to the OR. As an intern, I had gone up to the OR. SG was like, he's going to be bad shape. Because he went in with a pH of 6.9 and a lactate of 30. Now he just had an operation for dead gut that he didn't have. So now the lactate's going to be, he's going to be he's dead. Lactate was 8. Two hours later, lactate was 2. Then he was pointing in his endotracheal tube, and he wanted to get extubated. He asked for a food tray, for God's sakes, four hours later. Then he wanted to go home. Then he went home the next day. And I said to the chief surgical friend, I said, what happened? I don't know, I don't care. That's one less patient we have to deal with today, next day. <laughs> All right. What happened to that guy? Well, does anyone know, by the way, what happened to that guy? No. He, he got one thing in the emergency department, just one drug. No antibiotics, 500 cc's of fluids, and one thing. No, no. He got a dose of thiamine. Because one of the interns said, oh, I think this guy's an alcoholic. And so I was fascinated by this. It had to be the thiamine. I found that there was a link between thiamine and lactic acidosis. I published, then I realized that this, I saw another person, then he did me a favor. He came back six months later. We gave him some thiamine, and he went home the next day. We saw someone else with the same thing. We described what I declared as a new syndrome. Frankly, I don't know if it really was. They might have been a continuum of beriberi. We called it GI beriberi. We published it. We reported it wrote a review article, did a study on thiamine deficiency when I became a, a junior faculty, showing that it's prevalent in septic shock. Got a grant from the NIH to do a randomized trial with thiamine septic shock. Have three grants from the NIH right now, R01s, or two R01s and a K24 based on thiamine. It's a case I saw, okay? Almost all my research turns back to something I saw in the clinical setting. So keep your eyes open. Report it, teach it, study it, repeat. And think innovatively what you can publish and write about. I was fascinated because in the internal medicine world, I, I, I was running and looking at codes on the floor, and I saw these people getting, I, I couldn't believe my eyes, they got return to spontaneous circulation. And then someone jumped on the chest and gave two minutes of CPR because they had to give that final two minutes of CPR, right? They didn't recognize that after you got ROSC, the game was over. So we actually just surveyed people and found out that 50% of folks didn't actually understand that when you get return spontaneous circulation, you don't have to do another two minutes of CPR. We published that. So you can publish all sorts of observations that you make in the clinical setting. Um, you want to ask yourself, is this interesting to you? Do you think it will be interesting to others? And is the concept significant? You might not have all three of those, so you've got to kind of balance and decide whether you want to put in the time. But those are, I think, some of the key elements to consider. Leadership. I guess it's a little bit early. I didn't know what exactly kind of crowd, but I th think that it's important. Actually, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about leadership and when you're going to start rising up into leadership positions, you know. Um, and one of, I think, the, 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 the most important things about starting to develop as a leader is actually just showing up. You know, if you show up and you're reliable, you get assigned. People I want to help in my group who I want to lead something, they show up and they're reliable. That's the first part of leadership, to get into a leader position, showing up and being reliable. Being innovative, name it. Name it's a fun one. Here's another, so I, I went in for a yearly review. Um, I, had a, I had to get yearly review to my emergency department half and my 
critical care half. So I go in the, in the, um, uh, the uh, chief of uh, pulmonary critical care says, you know, we've had a lot of publications this last year. I said, oh, good, great. I thought I was going to get a compliment, you know. That's not, it, what happens is you actually can't get compliments from the critical care folks. It doesn't happen. It's like, you know, it's a thing. But it's all right. Um, you just smile and say, okay, well, I said, well, he said, he said well, did you really do all those publications? I said, of course I did. I put my names on them. He said, well, how did you do that? I said, well, because we're a team. And we went and I went to describe how my whole team works and everything like that. And he says to me, well, you should name your team. I said, okay. So I went home that day and I said, I said, and I said I, well, it's, hey, by the way, ask me what, what, I, what I do. Well, what, 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 describe myself? Yeah, how's it? What do I do? Well, just, just say, uh, I won't play with you. Okay, so like this. So if you said to me, hey, what do you do? If I said, well, I do some uh, research in cardiac arrest and, uh, and sepsis, and I lead a research group. Sounds pretty good, huh? Good enough. What if I said this? Well, yeah, I'm uh, the director of the Center of Resuscitation Science. We're a multidisciplinary research group that does translational work. Sounds pretty good, right? It's the same thing. I just repackaged it slightly. So I went home that night. And I said, I'm the Center of Resuscitation Science. I came in the next day. I went to my chief in the emergency department, chief in the pulmonary. Uh, what do you guys think? We'll just declare ourselves a Center of Resuscitation Science. It sounds good. And so it was. I got that next grant review back from the NIH. You know what they said? Strong infrastructure at the Center of Resuscitation Science. I was like, awesome. <laughs> OK? And if you build it, it will be true. And it, it has. It's, now it's a real thing. You know, we have space. We have a group. I, now we have 30 people. You know, it's a real center. At that time, it was a vision. So name it. If you have a group, name it. That will help with grants and whatnot. And then, again, I think growth through teamwork and developing good leadership skills is key. I, I'm disappointed sometimes in this, uh, the, the, the process of devaluing teamwork. And I, it's very important to me and anyone who works with my group that we're a team. We rarely ever have, it's hard for me to think of, when we talked before about authorship problems, we don't have them. Because you know what my solution is? We create more work and opportunity so no one has the opportunity to complain about authorship. If you're worried about authorship, here's another project to do. And I think you need to foster that environment of teamwork. Societies, committees, and more. So I think it's important to consider what societies align with your goals. SAM is an awesome society, where you want to put your time in. For me, the American Heart Association has a big part of my career. I was interested in cardiac arrest. It was perfect. I would put my time into a committee. It actually also translated to guidelines and publications. And so it actually really helped my career in a lot of different ways. You have local, national, and international committees. You, yes, go ahead. No, no, you can say. I was going to go back and ask a question about the teamwork thing. Yeah. I am also a clinical care team. I put my time in the department. Yep. Do you have advice for, sorry, for navigating the waters across, because in my institution, going across the lines of yeah. various uh, departments has been one of the biggest hindrances I've had to developing bigger programs like this. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll answer it. I have a slide coming on this in the, in the future. It's not easy. It's, what, one of the things that I do, and again, like I said, there's more than one ways to slice, the, you know, to, to look at things. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer in focusing on um, and I'll say this now instead of my, my other, um, my upcoming slide. I think it's very important to look at the circle, the, the area that you have influence over. And by focusing on what you can do to better yourself and better your area, you will ironically, I don't know if ironically is the right word, over time develop the influence in other areas. So what I mean by that is this. I tend not to worry about areas that I don't have control over. So when I don't, when I 
thought many years ago that the American Heart Association guidelines should be X instead of Y. I didn't spend time worrying about that. I tried to study it, I tried to interest it, and I bettered myself and I got on you know, different committees and all of a sudden I find myself in an odd position 12 years later being on the committee that actually makes the guidelines. So by focusing on what I was able to do, and the same thing with groups around the hospital. So I didn't get much interest in a cardiac arrest center. So we went it alone. And then we started developing our area. And then all, we created a post-arrest consult service. And you know what ended up happening? All of these people who rejected us at 3 o'clock in the morning, they wanted our help. And now all of a sudden, the intensivists were looking to the post-cardiac arrest service that was developed by myself and another EM critical care person. And now, fast forward 12 years later, I have multiple pulmonary critical care people wanting to be part of it. So my advice would be to focus on the areas. And so what you just said is some really good stuff. If you don't have somebody taking a stop sign and putting it in front of you, if you're able to actually make that pulmonary team, I would keep going. If you have to bring in people from the emergency department and embarrass them into helping you, in, bring it in. You know, and then what, if you better yourself over time, I would argue that what will happen is, is they will want to be part of your team, potentially. Doesn't always work, but that's just the strategies that I employ. Um, yeah, and again, in some areas it hasn't worked for me, and then I move into different space. I work to the space I can control. So, and when getting to these committees and more with local, national, international committees, I'm constantly reassessing. When I first got, as a junior faculty, I was put on the central line committee. That was like a thing back in the day. You didn't want to get these, there was, there was a big push about central line infections. And it actually, I, I learned a lot. I thought it was important, but in about two or three years, I realized showing up every month and listening to the, how many line infections we had in the hospital was not worth my time. And I moved on. I actually then chose the code committee, in which I sat on for a number of years as a member and I showed up. And one day, the chair of the code committee noticed that I showed up. And he said, I'm going to step down. Would you like to be the chair of the code committee? And I was. So look at the committees that make it sense to you. Code committee made sense to me. Show up. Take the committees that you start to outgrow and get rid of them. And continue to build yourself. This was the slide I was going to show in reference to your thing. Um, if, how many people have read the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? I, I, I recommend this. I can't do justice to this in a slide. But I share this with you because we're talking a lot about trying to accomplish these. It's, it's possible to be very busy without being very effective. It's a very interesting book. And I think the premise of the book is that you need to look inward, focus on yourself, focus on things that you can change, and then you will start to see um, habits develop. Um, where you can be effective, and it's and it's it's a very there's, there's I can't do justice to it, but I would highly advise this book starting out, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, but the point is, is that you can kind of get yourself into all these different directions, and I'm trying to stay focused on things that are important to me, important to my goals. How do we move forward? This is not to be mixed with Stephen Covey, but the same idea is this. Um, two by two diagram. Anybody, rec anybody recognize this? Who this comes from? The urgent. Who said that? Eisenhower. Yeah, it's Eisenhower. So this is Dwight Eisenhower, who has the urgent on, uh, uh, versus non-urgent, and on the other side, important, not important. And if something's urgent and important, he does it first. If it's not urgent, not important, it's completely off his table. If it's, it's, uh, if it's not urgent and important to do it later. Now, I kind of, the point is, is that in your head, you want to kind of prioritize things. I have to admit, I'm a, I'm a big delegator. So I, you know, the ones where he puts not urgent, important, do later, I might delegate it, but then supervise it. Um, what not. But the point is, is you want to be consciously thinking about what you're doing, what you're putting aside, and what you're putting your time into. If you're spending 10 hours a week reviewing somebody else's IRBs and only one hour writing your own, you've taken on some role that is probably not doing yourself a service. And I've seen that happen. So think about what you're doing. All right. So where are we? You're now doing what you like. You're publishing the area you enjoy. If you're an investigator, maybe you got some grants. You're increasing your leadership roles, teaching locally and beyond. Boom, you've hit your vision. And if all's going well, you should be failing a lot. How many people like that? You like that idea? Sounds pretty bad, right? Yeah. But seriously, I actually, and again, I'm not going to do justice in a slide. I have an entire lecture dedicated to um, failing to succeed. I actually think the difference 
one of the differences between people who tend to, in the long term, succeed and others who get discouraged and don't do as well is you should fail a lot, but you should fail well. I look at failure as a growth. I don't look at failure as an endpoint. I'll use one example. Again, like I said, this is like almost an hour discussion on failure, I think. But I'll put one example with grants. When I submit a grant, I'm working for my grant. I'm working for my grant. And then when I submit that, I've put my effort into it. And, and as soon as I submit that grant, most people I will hear say, oh, in two months, I'll find out if I get funded. And we'll go from there. The moment I submit the grant, I put my heart in and I think optimistically. I'm not a nihilist. But once it goes in, I'm going to assume that grant's not going to get funded. I'm going to assume I'm writing a revision. I'm going to take the preliminary data from that grant. I'm going to take it and put it into another grant to get ready to submit as well. I might even try and submit two of the same grants, or maybe I'll start to move into multiple other grants. And I look forward to getting that grant back and looking at the rejection and seeing what I can do to put in a revision. Because it's just a stepping stone. It's not an end point. So if you learn how to fail well, it's going to help you in the long run. I think that's very important. OK, so fine. Now you channel your inner Roy. You, you, you've got your vision. Now it's time to channel your inner Roy side, not Walt, and make sure you're capturing all the nuts and bolts. Am I running down on time? Is it? OK, so I'm just going to kind of a, a slow a stuff here, I think. But, um, then there is a checklist of things that I think are important. But my overall point in this lecture was I think you need to get your vision and your, yourself on track first. And then it comes to the nuts and bolts. And it's all going to follow. So if you've been doing everything we just talked about, you're going to have the publications. You're going to have the lectures. The, and, and then you can go to whoever is managing the promotion from step to step and kind of make sure that you have those little rungs of those check boxes. Now, and as John Edlow in our department says, keep track of everything, everything that you do in the lecture. Um, is important. Uh, I mean, everything that you do should go on your CV and whatnot, and you can kind of keep track of everything, um, and that's important for your promotion. Now, the other thing is, right before I do my conclusion, I can't help myself because we're in Vegas, and you know, if we, I, I, I got this dice. You know, if we, I, I, I knew if we were coming to Vegas, I had to, I had to bring dice. So what we're going to do here, right before we close, okay? Um, oh, you, you can do this, well, right? Here's what we do. I want you to just take this dice. Take any number you want, put it face up, and then put your hand over. So no one in the room can see it, particularly not me. You can put it on the table, though. You let me know when you're done. You're done? Yep. You've chosen? Yep. Hmm. What do you think she chose? You know what most people choose? Three. But she didn't. She didn't. Say, just say it out loud, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You see that? She hesitated on five. You chose a five. Open your hand. Is it a five? five. It's a five. All right, OK. I must have got lucky. All right, <laughs> flip one more time. Flip one more time. Do I have one more time for a little fun with this? OK, go ahead, flip that there. Now I want you to do is see, take a look through here. We've got sepsis, GI bleed, <coughs> cardiogenic shock, stroke. You see all the different things here? Now while she's doing that, I want you to take out one hand. Just do it with one finger, one thumb. Just take a look there in uh, whatever you want. Diagnosis. OK, throw that away. Throw it that way. Just yeah, chuck it. You got diagnosis in your head? OK. Just think of that number out loud. Think of the diagnosis. Think of the vital signs. Like think of if you have a fever, hypoxia, tachycardia. You thought of hypoxia, didn't you? you did, uh, no, you didn't, huh? <laughs> <laughs> think of what vital sign. Tachycardia. You thought of tachycardia, didn't you? I see. OK. Um, and you got a six there, right? Yeah, open it up. It's a six. Thank you. And think of the study. Think of the first letter of the study that you would get for this. OK. It's a CT scan. And you just diagnosed a pulmonary embolism. Is that right? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, so the, I will end. With this, so yeah, I have a side gig. It's a mentalist gig. And the point of that, I don't, I'm running out of time, so I can't make a point, I don't think, with this. But the point with this is, is that actually, so I do have a side gig where a mentalist and magic, and you know the difference between a good mentalist and a good magician and someone who doesn't do so good? It's creating a narrative. Because anybody could tell you to go pick a card. But if you have a story and you tell a story, the show is immensely better. So today, I want to say that you should develop your vision and goals first. And then you can get to the nuts and bolts.
Charter a path effectively to achieve these goals depending on your pathway. Prioritize work effectively based on your goals and continue to grow in leadership role and always reassess as you go. Thank you.